Welcome to Hope Unlimited Church and welcome to our Passion Week service. The week starting from Palm Sunday till Easter is known as the Passion Week or the Holy Week. Very important, we trace the journey of Jesus Christ as his ministry comes to the climax, as his mission is being accomplished. This is a very important week. Yesterday we had a Palm Sunday service and today is the second day of the Passion Week. Every day we will look into the word of the Lord. We will have short devotions and then on Friday we will have a Good Friday service and on Sunday we will have our Easter service. You know, it is our prayer that as you, as we meditate on the word of the Lord, it will transform us from the inside out. Let's look into the word of God. Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 reads like this. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. This great big God did not come so that we can serve him. We people who are lesser than him can serve him. But this great big God came to serve us people who are far lesser than him. Far more weaker. We are weaker than him. We are so fragile. He came to serve us. The Bible talks about God and the Bible paints a beautiful picture, a very powerful picture of God. There are many verses in the Bible which talks about the greatness, the strength, the creative power of God. Omnipotence means that God is all powerful. There is nobody as powerful as our God. You can see his power in the way he defended his people. But you can also see his power by looking at everything around you. Look at the creation. They declare the glory of God. All creation declares how powerful our God is. Let's look at some verses at this time. Psalms chapter 33 verse 9. It says, for he spoke and everything came into being. He commanded and creation stood firm. There was no effort on part of God when he created everything. He spoke and things just happened. We call this as ex nihilo, God making everything out of nothing. He is a powerful God. He is God creator. Let's look at some of the verses. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Now this is talking specifically about Jesus Christ. It says, for in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, with the thrones, powers, rulers, or the authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All creation is for Jesus Christ, created through him and created for him. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17, the very next words, it says, he was before all things and in him all things hold together. Two things about this verse. Number one, God is not a created being. He was there in the eternal past. He is there right now in our present. He will continue to be there in the everlasting future. He is beyond this concept of time or space. He's far greater than any of them. The second part of this verse says, In him all things hold together. He is the one who sustains all of creation. He is the one who provides for the entire creation. If creation runs, if there is a delicate balance that is being maintained in creation, it is all because he holds it together. He is still in charge. He is still the commander in chief. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens. And all of the starry hosts. The earth and everything on it. The seas and all that is in them. And you give life to everything. And the multitude of heavens, they worship you. A powerful words indeed. It talks about God, not just as God who created everything, but talks about God as the life-giving source. If we are alive, it's because of him. 
if I'm breathing, if I can see things, if I can sense things, it's all because of him. He breathed the life into us. He is the source of life. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 24 reads like this. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads up the earth by myself. Isaiah talks about God and he says, the same God who spoke creation into existence, the same God who sustains the whole of creation, the same God who is the life-giving source, he is the same God who made you and me. You know what? Elsewhere in the Bible, the Bible says that he knit us in the womb of our mother. He's the one who brought those cells together. He's the one who brought us together, those molecules, those nerves together. And I am who I am because God is involved in this. We are so special. God took time. God took that care to bring all of us together. He loves us. He cares for us. He's the one who made us. And you know something? He knows me better than I know myself. There's so many things that I just don't understand about myself. Sometimes I don't understand why I do things the way I do. I don't even understand sometimes how this body, this mind functions. But you know what? He keeps account of each and every hair on my body. The very next breath that I'm going to breathe is ordained by him. He knows me better than I know myself. He cares for me and he loves me. The Bible talks about God as God who is powerful, God who is strong. He is God omnipotent, all-powerful God. Added to this, he's not just omnipotent. God is also omnipresent. That means he's present everywhere. And God is also omniscient. He knows everything. He has knowledge of everything. He doesn't learn anything new because there's nothing new. He in fact declares the end before the beginning begins. He is God so strong and he is God so powerful. Let's look at another aspect. We find it again in the Bible. The Bible talks about us human beings. And the Bible talks about us as, as if we are the crown of all God's creation. God created everything. Finally, he made us humans. And he said, go have dominion over each and everything. We are the crown of God's creation. But you know what? Among everything that God created, the only creation that rebelled against him is us human beings. The trees worship him. The angels worship him. The heavens worship him, the sun, moon, stars, mountains, everything worships him, us human beings. We, we rebelled against him, we led an active life of rebellion against him. The Bible talks about our fallen estate. The Bible talks about this rebellion that we led, led against God, this sinful nature in us. And this is how the Bible describes it. Psalms chapter 51 verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We call it the original sin. None of us are born perfect. None of us are born holy. None of us are born pure. Since the time of Adam, since the sin of Adam, everybody who is born is born in sin. We carry that sin from generation to generation. The original sin, sinful by birth. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20. Indeed, there is no one on earth, no one who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. It talks about the frailty of us human beings. All of us are so prone to sin. If you leave us alone, 
we tend to do something wrong we tend to go astray something is it's, it's built inside of us the ability or the potential or the leaning towards sin isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 all of us have become like the one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags we all shrivel up like a leaf and like a wind our sins sweep us away if we think we are righteous do you know how the bible describes our righteousness filthy rag all of us led a rebellion against god 1 john chapter 1 verse 8 just in case we are thinking that you know we are some of us are pure some of us are immune to sin 1 john says if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if anybody claims that he is without sin or immune to sin that very act itself is sin because he is lying Romans chapter 3 verse 23 nails it all for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God come I think one thing we need to accept is none of us are perfect none of us are perfect I think except Jesus all of us fell one time or the other all of us are weak doesn't mean that we do not love the Lord doesn't mean that I'm not a Christian, I'm not born again, I'm not spirit-filled. I'm not perfect. I love the Lord, but I still struggle with a lot of things in my life. You know, it really makes me wonder. This great big God that the Bible describes, why did he come into my world? And that too for someone like me. I think Paul writes to the Philippian church, and this is how it describes Jesus coming into our world. Who being in very nature God, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the ever-present God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. But taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death even death on the cross it really makes me think why is this God of justice God so holy God so righteous look at people who are sinful people who have rebelled against him people who are leading an active rebellions against God and people who are even enjoying the passing pleasures of sin why is this great and powerful God why did he decide to come into my world and that to assume a position like this position of a servant what is in me I look into myself I look at each and every one of us there's nothing worth in any one of us really there's nothing worth all of us deserve the fires of hell yet when I look at what Jesus did I know that even though I do not have a value my God gave me a value but God gave me a value. Now Rick Warren talks about this. Now he says that the value of anything is determined by what you're willing to exchange for it. Think about this. If I see a diamond in a jewelry store, I would be willing to pay 5, 10, 15 lakhs for it. Why? Because that's the value of it. I will give money and I'll take that, that diamond. I will exchange it in that particular way. It's worth it. If I have to buy some vegetables, I will not pay 10 lakhs. I would pay whatever the sum, I would exchange it. That's the medium of exchange. The value of anything is determined by what you're willing to pay for it. Now think about Jesus on the cross. 
He uses the word tetelestai. In English we call it, it is finished. It can also mean paid in full. He came into our world, took on the role of a servant, went through everything that you and I would go through. He suffered, he persevered, he went through torment and his whole death was so disgusting. Spat upon, insulted, mocked, wounded, made to carry the cross and nailed on that cross, stripped naked on the cross. And on the cross he said, I paid it all. God so powerful, God so strong, gave his very life for me. That's what he exchanged. That's my value. For some of you who are looking, looking at this, this broadcast, you feel that nobody cares for you. You feel that you are unwanted. Somebody spoke into your life and they said they don't like you. Maybe your parents looked at you and said that they never planned you. You are a mistake. You just happened. You are an accident. Somebody rejected you. Somebody called you names. You know what? Jesus looks at you and says, you are the apple of my eye. You now Jesus looks at you and he says, see, I have engraven you on the palm of my hand. Jesus looks at you and he says, come see my hand, come see my side, come see my feet. If you were not precious to me, I wouldn't have died on the cross for you. For some of you who are feeling neglected now, some of you are feeling abandoned and lonely, Jesus speaks to you right now and he says, you are precious, you are valuable, I love you just the way you are. And you know what? The Bible talks about the love of God. And the Bible uses the word agape, agape to describe his love. Oh, let's look at agape. What does it mean? A love which is unconcerned with self and concerned with the greater good of the another. Agape isn't born just out of emotions, feelings, familiarity or attraction. It is not a love based on how you look, how good you feel. It is not a love based on what you have and what you do not have. It is a love springing from the will and it is a love because of a choice that is made. Agape requires faithfulness, commitment, sacrifice and that to sacrifice without expecting anything in return. He loved us with an agape love. Faithful, true, pure, holy. Even when I was leading an active rebellion against him, this great big God came into my world to serve me, to serve you, went through a painful death. And now he says, I love you just the way you are. You know, for those of you who have not really received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, now is the time. Why do you want to live your life alone without Jesus? When he says, I love you, I will be with you, I will never abandon you. When he cared for you, when we, when we never even knew about him. Why do you want to run away from him? My brother, my sister, I pray. Take time. Talk to Jesus. Sometime during this lockdown period, just say, Jesus, come into my heart come into my heart. I've been lonely. I tried a lot of things. I tried to find acceptance. I wanted people to receive me. I wanted people to validate me. People to just accept me as I am. It's not working out, Jesus. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior.